Hi everybody, today's video is a tricky P3 topic and it's going to be on circular motion including the centripetal force and we're also going to be talking about pendulums because I didn't want to do two separate videos. I'm going to attach some questions at the end of this. These are past exam questions with perfect answers so even if you're finding my talk to be relatively confusing because this is a hard topic, hopefully that will clear up any of your confusion. So we're going to start by looking at circular motion. So any object that moves in a circle has circular motion, whether that's a car driving around a racetrack, whether it's a satellite orbiting the Earth, these both have circular motion. Now in this topic we need to assume that they're travelling at a constant speed. However, it's now important that you understand the difference between speed and velocity because people use them interchangeably but they're not quite the same thing. Speed is how fast you're travelling and you can attach a unit to it such as 5 miles an hour, 10 meters per second, that sort of thing. Now velocity is a vector quantity whereas speed is a scalar quantity and all that means is that velocity has both a size, so yes you could be travelling at 5 meters per second, 10 miles an hour, however because it's a vector quantity it also has a direction and that's what makes velocity different to speed. They both have a size, 10 meters per second, but velocity has that added thing which is that it has a direction. So now we talk about an object moving in a circle and because it, although it's travelling at constant speed that object is constantly going to be changing direction and therefore it has a changing velocity. And the point is, the object's velocity is directed at a tangent towards the circle. That sounds horrible. From maths, hopefully you know that a tangent is just a line that touches the edge of a circle but just goes off at an angle. And therefore an object moving around a circle, the fact that it's constantly changing direction, the point is it will constantly change direction so that its velocity is aimed at a tangent. If that is horrible, ignore what I'm saying. I'm yet to see a question that mentions tangents. Just know that an object travelling at constant speed constantly changes its velocity. Now we need to touch on a separate point which is that the object's travelling at constant speed is also accelerating and that's like, what is she saying? Ah, that's so stressful. How can it be travelling at constant speed but also accelerating? Because acceleration to me means speeding up. No, we need to look at the technicalities of what the word acceleration actually means. Now, acceleration is given by the equation, which is change in velocity over time taken. And like I've just said, although you can be travelling at constant speed, the velocity changes because you're constantly changing direction. Therefore, in acceleration, if you're constantly changing your velocity, you're changing your direction, therefore you must be accelerating. So that is another point they may ask you. An object travelling at a constant speed is accelerating. Let's move on now. Any object that's travelling in a circle must be acted upon by a resultant force. The reason why is because otherwise that object would just fly off in any direction. But we know that that object's just going to keep moving round and round and round, so it must be being acted upon by a force which is keeping it moving in a circle. And we call that the resultant force, and because it's moving in a circle, we call it the centripetal force. Now, this is a question that commonly comes up. It's going to, the question may ask what three things affect the size of the resultant force or the centripetal force. So obviously, first of all, the mass of the object is going to have a big role to play because the larger the object, the greater the force needed to keep it moving. Second of all, the speed or its velocity, the velocity of the object, is going to impact on the size of the force needed to keep it in that place because the faster it's travelling, the greater its velocity, the larger the force needed to keep it moving in a circle. And lastly, the radius, so remember that is the distance from the centre of the circle to the edge, the size of that radius is going to impact the, the size of that force because obviously if the circle's bigger, it's going to need a smaller force to keep it moving. If that's sounding complicated, don't worry too much about whether it's bigger or smaller, just learn the three things which affect the resultant force, and that is the velocity of the object, the mass of the object, and the radius of the circle. And it doesn't matter if it's a car driving along a track or if it's a satellite orbiting a planet, these things all have a role to play. Now sometimes they ask you about the force which is acting on the object, causing it to move in the circular motion. So if it was a car travelling on a track, then that's going to be friction between the tyres and the um, road surface. If you're talking about a satellite orbiting a planet, then the force keeping it in that circular motion is going to be gravity. So now we're going to move on to pendulums, and remember pendulum is just a swinging object, so if it's a swing, or it's what, or a bob line, which they sometimes use, which is just a string with a weight, it's just going to keep moving back and forth. And there are a few key terms you need to know, such as the amplitude, and like in a sound wave or any kind of wave, it's the distance between 
the minimal, minimum disturbance and the maximum one. So from a pendulum point of view, it's where the bob line hangs to its maximum height. So that is the amplitude. Another thing they may ask you is the time period of the pendulum. And that is the time taken from the pendulum to move from its position resting all the way up to its maximum position on one side, all the way back down to and back up to the other side and then returning to its original position. So it's the time taken to complete a complete swing from one end to the next. It doesn't matter if you started here, measure the time taken from it, for it to travel from here all the way up, all the way back again, but that would be one complete time period. And they do provide you with that equation on the physics equation sheet. Again, they may ask you for the frequency. Remember that is the number of swings, complete swings that occur in one second. Um, you may just need to manipulate that equation, but remember that frequency is measured in hertz. Also, remember that the time period is actually only dependent on the length of the pendulum and it has nothing to do with the mass of the bob on the end. Just bear that in mind because some of those questions involving data will touch on that. But one last thing they may ask you is to measure the time taken for one time period and ask you the best way to do that. And rather than just measuring the time taken for one complete rotation, it might be better to measure 20 of those rotations and then find the average. So measure the time taken for 20 oscillations, divide by 20 and that will give you a more um, accurate idea of the time taken for one complete oscillation. And the very last thing I wanted to mention is the reason why the pendulum eventually stops swinging and that's due to friction and air resistance. I hope you found this video helpful. It's a really hard video to explain to you because I probably need some more complicated diagrams which at the moment I don't have the capability of producing. But hopefully these questions that I'm about to attach will um, be useful to you. Don't forget to like the video and subscribe and tell your friends about my channel and I'll see you very soon. Bye! Question 1. The clock shown in figure 1 uses a pendulum to keep time. The pendulum has a frequency of 0.8 Hz. Calculate the periodic time of the pendulum. Use the correct equation from the physics equation sheet. So using the correct equation means doing time equals 1 over frequency. Therefore 1 divided by 0.8 Hz to give us an answer of 1.25 seconds. 1b. A student investigated the factors affecting the oscillation of a pendulum. The student set up a pendulum as shown in figure 2. So we've got the pendulum bob and it's going to be swinging and we're using a stop clock to measure the time. The student investigated how many complete oscillations the pendulum made for different lengths of the pendulum and different masses of the pendulum bob. Remember a complete oscillation is when the pendulum blob moves up to its high position, back down, back up to the other side and then finally returns to the bottom position. Anyway, we've got length of pendulum in millimetres, mass of pendulum bob and number of complete oscillations made by the pendulum in 20 seconds. 1b. State two conclusions that the student should make from the results shown in table 1. These are the easiest sorts of questions. Just pull out some information from the table and you'll get the answer right. So let's scan down. We can see here that if you increase the length of the pendulum, then you decrease the number of oscillations. And you don't have to provide examples here, but let's just look and prove that that's right. Because yes, the shorter the length, 200 millimetres, it produces 22 oscillations. Whereas if we increase the length of the pendulum to like 600, then we produce far fewer complete oscillations here, only 13. And second of all, if we change the mass of the pendulum bob, it doesn't actually change the number of complete oscillations. 1b part 2. The student wants to be more certain that her conclusions are correct. Suggest two ways in which the investigation could be improved. So any suitable improvements here. So first of all, she could measure the number of swings over a wider range of pendulum lengths. She could measure the number of swings over a wider range of bob masses. She could measure the number of sw swings made over a greater period of time. Or she could repeat each measurement, and that's always a really good choice in these sorts of questions. Right, moving on to a... Sorry, that's traffic noise. Figure 3 shows a car travelling around a bend in the road. The car is travelling at a constant speed. There is a resultant force acting on the car. This resultant force is called the centripetal force. In which direction, A, B, C or D, does the centripetal force act on the car? Remember that it always acts towards the centre of the circle that it's rotating around, so therefore it needs to be a tick in D. State the name of the force that provides the centripetal force. Well, in this case, because it's a car travelling along the road, it's going to be friction and that will be between the surface of the road and the car tyres. You don't need to write that, just write friction here for me. 2a. State two factors that affect the size of the centrifugal force acting on the car. Please just learn these answers. They always come up, these sorts of questions. You can pick here the speed or velocity, the radius of the bend, 
Um, or you could say like the curvature of the road, that sort of thing. And lastly, the mass of the car. So that's something I would definitely learn. Always learn velocity and the mass. 2B, figure four shows a racing car. The racing car should not roll over when racing. State two features of the car that make it difficult for the car to roll over. Again, this question comes up. It's because it has a low center of mass. As you can see, it's very, very close to the ground. And also it has a very wide base and that means it's gonna be very unlikely that the car will topple over. Question two, man-made satellites can orbit the Earth as shown in figure three. The satellite experiences a resultant force directed towards the centre of the orbit. The resultant force is called the centripetal force. What provides the centripetal force on the satellite? Well, it's not going to be friction like before um, with the car example we just looked at. This time it's going to be due to the gravitational attraction between the satellite and the Earth, or just right gravity if you prefer. And all that is, remember, is gravity keeps... Um, satellites and moons and things orbiting around their planets and in that case therefore we need to talk about gravity here. 2b state two factors that determine the size of the centripetal force on the satellite so yes like I said this question comes up a lot so you want to talk about the mass of the satellite and also its speed or velocity and lastly you could have mentioned the radius of its orbit. 2c table 1 gives data for five different satellites orbiting the earth. Here we've got satellites at a low height and once at a high height, state the relationship, if any, between the height of the satellite above the Earth's surface and the time taken for the satellite to orbit the Earth once. Right, so again, you're saying what you see here. You need to say that the higher the satellite, the longer it takes for the um, satellite to orbit the Earth once. 2C part 2, state the relationship, if any, between the time taken for the satellite to orbit the Earth once and the satellite's mass. And if you look closely at the numbers, you can see that there's no relationship. So you write here, no relationship or no correlation. 2D. Over 300 years ago, the famous scientist Isaac Newton proposed with a thought experiment the idea of satellites. Newton suggested that if an object was fired at the right speed from the top of a high mountain, it would circle the Earth. Why did many people accept Isaac Newton's idea as being possible? Firstly, Isaac Newton was a respected scientist who had made new discoveries before. Yeah, that's sounding quite likely to be, but I'm just going to double check with the other answers on Isaac Newton went to university. Yeah, that's great, but we don't know. It's not saying what he studied there, so that wouldn't be a reason to agree with him. And it was a new idea that nobody else had thought of before. That's not a reason why anyone would accept it. So, yeah, you need to put a tick in the first box. The diagram shows a G machine. The G machine is used in astronaut training. The G machine moves the astronaut in a horizontal circle. When the G machine is rotating at constant speed, the astronaut is accelerating. State the name and direction of the force causing the astronaut to accelerate. Hopefully you've learnt this from your lessons and the name of this force is always centripetal force. Basically, as soon as we know that he's moving in a circle, um, it should be screaming centripetal at you. And the direction of the force, it doesn't matter what it is that's turning in a circle, it always, the force always acts towards the centre of that circle. So that's what you need to write there. It doesn't matter if it's an astronaut or a car or what was the last example? I literally can't remember. Anyway, the force causing the astronaut to move in a circle is measured. The graph shows how the speed of an astronaut affects the force causing the astronaut to move in a circle for two different G-machines. The radius of rotation of the astronaut is different for each G-machine. State three conclusions that can be made from the graph. So have a good look at the graph. First of all, we can see here that the greater the speed, the greater the force. Secondly, we can see that the smaller the radius, the greater the force. And lastly, this one's slightly harder, as the speed increases, the rate of change in force increases. But what you're doing really here is just saying what you can see on the graph. The speed of rotation of G Machine 1 is increased from 20 meters per second to 40 meters per second. Determine the change in force on the astronaut. Right, so we're looking at G Machine 1, so that's this line. And we know that the speed has increased from 20 seconds to 40 seconds. So we're looking along this line here. So let's take it up. Sorry about how wonky it is. And then just read across on the y-axis here and here and work out how big this is. So read it off using the squares and you'll see that the answer here is 12,000 newtons. And I'm just going to finish off with a pendulum question. So 6C. During his holiday, the man visits the full court pendulum in Paris, France. The pendulum makes 10 complete swings every 160 seconds. Calculate the frequency of the pendulum and give the unit and use the correct equation. So remember the correct equation from that sheet is time equals 1 over frequency. However, we need to work out the time taken to complete one complete swing. So if it took 160 seconds to complete 10 swings, 
then one swing took 16 seconds, so there's our time. So 16 equals 1 over f. Rearrange that equation so it's 1 divided by 16 equals f. And that will get you an answer of, use your calculator quickly, Hazel, 0 0.0625. And you must include the unit here because it's asked you to, and that is hertz because it is frequency. Right, I hope you found this video helpful. Um, don't forget to give it a big thumbs up if you want more like it, and I'll see you very soon. Bye. Thank you.